Writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. We're bringing you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Joni. So in this episode, we talked to Nora Shalloway Carpenter about her debut novel, The Edge of Anything, which I believe has released. Yep. So before she wrote books, she served as an associate editor of the wonderful West Virginia magazine, and she's also a certified yoga teacher since 2012. And I wasn't actually in this interview, but... Joni had brought in a perfect co-host for this episode. Yeah, we recorded without Steph as she was on vacation in Florida. I asked our Kobo facilities coordinator, Jen Shinuda, I asked her to be our guest co-host. And I asked her particularly because Nora's debut novel deals with a teenager who suffers from obsessive compulsive disorder, which was taken from Nora's own real life struggles. And Jen, our coworker, has also written a lot and spoken very openly about her own struggles with OCD. So I thought she'd be a great co-host in Steph's absence, and she was. We also recorded this on the very last day that the Kobo office was open. We thought we were going to shut for two weeks, and we have been closed ever since. So, so yeah, if any mentions, it might be a little out of date. <laughs> might be a little out of date, but I think still relevant today. But yeah, it's a great interview. Nora was really, really lovely, and I'm excited for everyone to hear it. So please keep listening. Thank you, Nora, for speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So we just read your book, The Edge of Anything, which I believe comes out in Canada this month, later this month. Is that right? Yep. It comes out on March 24th. So it will be out by the time this comes out. Can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and I have a master's degree in creative writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts. I have been on a writing journey pretty much my whole life since I was a little kid. So it's really interesting to see it and exciting to see it come to fruition. My other interests, I love being outside. I love doing yoga. I love doing sports. I love reading. Yeah. And I have three young children and a husband, all of whom keep me very busy when I'm not writing. So you say that you've been on a journey to writing your whole life. Can you tell us about how you started writing? Sure. Let's see. I guess I've always loved telling stories. I mean, I think, you know, that's kind of just in our DNA. Little kids love telling stories, right? And so as a child, I would just kind of make up these wild stories and my parents encouraged me to write them down. And I actually just found my parents moved recently and they gave me this big box and it's like Nora's writings and it's all from like my elementary days and pretty hysterical of some of the stuff that's in there. So just started kind of writing for myself and my own enjoyment. But my parents were both big readers. So I knew, I knew, you know, that you could be a writer and you could publish books. So I kind of always had that dream and I was encouraged in elementary school. But as I got older, it seemed less and less practical. You know, like when I went to college, I didn't major in creative writing or anything because I thought I wouldn't be able to make a career of that. Um, so I kind of took a, a really curvy path, I guess, to come back to it later. Basically, it was just a calling that I couldn't ignore. I tried to do some other things. And then I ended up being really jealous of all my friends that were in creative writing programs. And (laughs) so started just while I was working, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to see if I can actually write like a book, you know, like a full length book. And I did that while kind of in my free time while I was working and then started going to conferences, just meeting people that were in the industry and telling me, well, you know, you really should, you know, you should check out SCBWI. You should, you know, go to local writers conferences. You should work on your craft. And so just kind of started dabbling in it, sticking my toes in. And then actually during a writers conference, met a bunch of people from BCFA who were like, if you really want to do this, you should look at this program. We love it. It's so good. And it was one of those moments where I kind of just leapt off a cliff. I felt like I really had like a career change. And I was like, well, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should go back to school and really, really do this. This is something I have a calling for. And maybe I should just put myself all in. And I remember I got accepted into the program. And I remember sitting in the airport on the way to Vermont for my first residency and just being like, what am I doing? Like, I don't, I don't know anyone there, like, except for these people that I met at the conference and everything, but like, I hadn't gone to visit. Like I, I did like online research and things like that, but it was just such like a crazy moment where I'm like, what, what, what is, what am I going into? But it ended up being wonderful. And just, I learned so much during that program. And actually when I finished 
I told one of my advisors, I was like, well, now that I've done and I have this MFA, I kind of feel like I'm like ready for the program now, you know, <laughs> like it's just, I learned a lot, but I learned kind of how to go about the right, the writer's life is, I guess I learned a lot about too, in terms of craft, but just, just about like what it takes to be a writer. If you are going to try and make it in this business, if you are going to try and publish traditionally, just the day to day work of it and the emotional cycles and the cycles of rejection and perseverance and all that stuff like that. And the close friendships. I always tell people that are interested in getting into the writing business, like get yourself some writer friends, you know, and definitely I was very, as a teenager and early young adult, I guess, I didn't really know how to do that. And I was kind of adverse to it because I would meet some people that were a little bit, you know, how do I want to phrase it? Like, hoity-toity, I guess, about their writing or whatever, like people would try to like one up each other sometimes and find a community that's not like that. You know, like there's so many awesome, incredibly talented writers out there that really want to give you like constructive feedback and, you know, you exchange like constructive feedback with each other and you help each other instead of like some writing communities, I think especially I've heard in the adult world can kind of like be more of like tearing each other down, which is, you know, you don't want to find people like that, but find people that you can rely on in times of stress because there's definitely a lot of it <laughs> in this mm -hmm. business. So it sounds like the program was worth the risk for you. <laughs> it was, it was for me. I mean, I, you know, it's always... I know not everybody, that's not everyone's path. A lot of people don't go to graduate school and become mm -hmm. very successful writers, like not saying you have to do that or anything, but if you are considering an MFA program, for me, it was certainly worth it. I would say for the community, just as much as for all the craft stuff that I learned. Awesome. It also seems that when you're talking about community, uh, just in writing groups, mm -hmm. you can kind of see that reflected in your novel as well even though it's a different age group. Yeah, it's a lot of female friendship, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That has always been really important to me in my whole life. But yeah, definitely in, it's interesting in this period of life where I am right now, I have two really close female writer friends that we're just like in constant contact every day. And we, we live in different parts of the country, but through the wonders of technology, you know, we can stay really close and just support each other through everything. And I really, I don't know how you could survive in this business really without those kinds of relationships. A lot of our authors are in the indie author community and they self-publish. And I think the indie author community is known for being super supportive because people are working alone a lot of the time. And I've heard that from a lot of people we've spoken to. Yeah, I've noticed just on Twitter, like with the hashtag writing community, there's a lot of indie authors on there. And there's always, I've seen that as well, like just on social media, people just being super supportive, giving each other lifts, you know, just retweeting when people have books. It's really cool. Like, and I'm so glad to see that because I really think, I, I hate the whole idea of like, oh, you know, only certain people are writers or you have to born to, you, you know, you're born creative or you're born not. Like, I just don't think that's true at all. You know, I think if you want to be a writer, you want to get in this business, no matter which publishing path you pursue, like you can do it if you, you know, if you put in the work and you're persistent and I'm just glad to see other writers lifting each other up. Yeah, it's awesome to see. So I asked Jen to do this interview with me. She doesn't normally do the podcast. Um, okay. Because it's an own voices story, right? And you were writing a lot about your own experiences with OCD. Mm -hmm. And I know Jen mm -hmm. has also a little bit of experience with that. So we wondered about um, how that impacted your writing. I'd be curious to know your thoughts on it, Jen, then, because mm -hmm. it's always interesting when you have some, or, or when I, I hear back from readers, early readers that have um, some experience with that. So I went through... I really, I, I have OCD, like you said, I went, it's manageable now, I'm pleased to say, but I, I did go through um, a really awful time years ago when it was super severe. I went through a trauma that kind of, I, I definitely had OCD before, like I didn't know that's what it was, like when I was younger and everything, because I didn't have any diagnoses or anything like that, but then it just got really worse after this significant moment in my life, and I was in this dark spiral. And it was basically, I honestly didn't know if I was going to survive it. I, it was, I was in a really bad place. And I once through 
a lot of work and help with like friends help and my husband's support. Um, once I kind of got out of that place and got things under control, I knew that I needed to write about a character that was suffering with an undiagnosed severe mental health issue because that's how I process things. I'm a writer, but I also knew I needed enough distance. I had to have enough emotional distance to do it well. And because I didn't want to write it, the story is not autobiographical. Like that's not, you know, I didn't, otherwise I would just write it, you know, <laughs> something that was no, about I my experience. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But I wanted to be able to take uh, the emotion from that experience and um, and the fear that I felt in that moment and the confusion. And I wanted to be able to infuse that authentically into a character. And the reason I, I mean, I am a young adult author, but also it was so difficult for me when I went through it as a, a young, I mean, I was a young adult, but like in my twenties and I had a, you know, I had a spouse, I had someone who was supportive. And, and even though I ran up against lots of, um, stereotypes and people kind of being like, oh, you should, you know, just, why are you acting this way? Like, you should just stop, snap out of it. You know, like, why are you so sad? Like, mm -hmm. And um, I still had a lot of support, but it was still so hard to find out, figure out what was happening to me, you know, like, because I didn't, I didn't really know much about OCD. I just kind of had like this general knowledge of like, it was, or what I thought, I guess was like, oh, it's just people that like to clean a lot or something, you know, like just really not an accurate description. And it was so hard for me with all the resources at my disposal. I thought, well, what if this was a teenager that didn't have these resources? Like how would a person deal with that? Like what would they do? What support? And if they're thinking that they're going crazy, that they're slowly losing their mind, like how can you ask for help in that situation and how can you talk to someone and if you have a condition which can kind of push people away from you because you're acting strange you know quote unquote strangely just what do you do so I was really interested in that question and that's how Len came to be. As someone who was also diagnosed in my 20s I thought reading it that it was fantastic that Thank you. not <laughs> it was fantastic but <laughs> not, not, not only do I think it can reach teens especially because I don't think in my teens and I'm not sure about you that I'd be scouring sort of self-help books or anything right. like that right so the fact that it, you chose to write fiction I think in a way can really reach out to teens and I also wondered I said man if this novel had been around around the time I was first starting to experience everything it might have shaved off you know 10 years you know of not being diagnosed, mm -hmm. who knows? So what, what are your hopes for teens who might be suffering, you know, from, from either mental health issues or physical health issues with this book? Yeah. Well, my hopes are definitely just that, that they can read it and see themselves in it. And first of all, know that they're not alone because I remember, I don't know if that was your experience, but for me, I was definitely like, Mm -hmm. I am the only person in the world that is having this experience. Like what the heck is happening to me? Something is not right. I am not normal. I felt like I brought it on myself somehow. I was like, Scott, like, what did I do? Like, why can I not control my thoughts? Like what is happening? And so I really hope that teen readers or any readers, if they read the book can see Len's day-to-day -day struggles and that it's not something that she's choosing to do and that she, you know, and that it's an act of strength to ask for help. You know, in our culture really stigmatizes mental health still. I mean, it's changing, but still there is a big stigma around it and asking, but not even just that <laughs> sometimes you have to ask different people. Like you might ask someone and, and they get you get shut down, which is, you know, kind of happens to Len at one point. Mm -hmm. She reaches out to like mm -hmm. the people closest to her and they don't really understand. And I did have that experience too. And it was awful. And it like set me back months, you know, because I was like, oh, well, you know, I tried to open up to someone and that went poorly. So I can't let anyone know. And then I went back to like hiding all of everything. So on the one hand, I hope readers that are maybe recognizing some things that they're struggling with in themselves and read the book, feel they're not alone, see that there are resources to get them help. And on the other hand, I hope teens and readers that aren't struggling with these kinds of things, but can view kind of like, oh, maybe 
this, maybe I need to look at my friend over here who has been acting strangely or like pulling into themselves. Like maybe there's something going on that as a teenager, you know, you're pretty much, you're consumed with yourself. Like you're all, you're thinking about yourself a lot, but I also just kind of wanted to, a way for teens to be a little bit more empathetic, I think, to other experiences and kind of see like ways that they could help while also not being like saviors, but you know, like recognizing these, pe- these characters, these people, their friends, anyone who's suffering, like they're normal people that are undergoing, you know, a really stressful thing. Just like we're all undergoing things all the time and just kind of realizing, well, how, what can I do to support this person? How can I let them know it's okay and that I'm here to help them and, you know, and that I'll be a support. So basically my hope is that the book can, can just help everybody. And really, I, I just hope it opens more of these kinds of conversations, more of these conversations about mental health. Because when I was going through my crisis time, there was nothing. I just couldn't even find anything about it, about people talking, you know, or, or I would find just really extreme examples and where people were just like, oh, that's just a crazy person, you know, and, and that's certainly not helpful. So really just opening up those conversations and letting readers know it's okay to talk to people, to kind of reach out, reach out for help. Something I really liked was that you had the parallels of these two teen girls going through something and one of them it was a physical health problem Mm -hmm. but really like they're going through the same thing and to me I felt like that drove home the message that mental health is health and one of them is going through something physical that is that a doctor can see Mm -hmm. on an exam and the other one isn't but you really get a very deep sense from the book that they are both going through the same thing like mental health is health yeah. And there shouldn't really be anything different. Was that a deliberate choice? Did you think about that when you were looking at Sage's story? So it's one of those like kind of happy accident, I think, where I had the idea of, of Sage's story and then I kind of figured out that she and Len needed to be in the same book and they were so related. And then I was like, ha look at this parallel and look how it works. You know, like this is great. So it wasn't that I started that way, but definitely once I figured it out, I was like, great, we can use this. And Sage, while she, you know, she is going through this physical health situation, she's definitely having, having some like mental health stuff too. You know, she's, she's very much in denial. Like there's a lot of parallels there. And I think by having both what I, what I let, what I didn't want to happen is I didn't want one of them to just help the other. And that was it, you know, like to one of them to be the savior and one to be like the quote unquote, like victim or whatever. Like I didn't want that to happen. I wanted the book to show that they were both struggling in different ways and they, but they were both strong in different ways and they were both able to help. They needed to save themselves, but they needed to save each other too. So just kind of playing with that idea of strength and the parallel stories in that way was definitely on my mind. What was it like for you writing for a teen audience? Are your kids around that age or are they younger or how did you speak to that audience? (laughs) Yeah. (sighs) It's, it's interesting. I've heard before that like, if you write for teens or like middle grade, it's like you're stuck in that world. Like middle grade authors are like stuck in the middle grade world and teen authors are stuck in the teen world. And I have such vivid memories of being a teenager of, of that time my kids are not teenagers. They're very small, but I interact with a lot of teens around here in my area. And so I am in that world and listening to them speak. And I do have friends with teenagers and it's so interesting too, to just kind of, you know, talk to them and soak up their language and, and conversations. But for me, why I love to write in that for teens and about teens is because teens are really, they're always on the brink, right? They're on the brink of self-discovery. And I love, I love that. I feel, I mean, people really always are. We're always changing. We're always kind of discovering ourselves, but there's something about being a teenager where you're really, you're kind of making that shift from childhood dependence to adult independence and sense of self-discovery. And I love playing with all the possibilities there. And, And I think teenagers are just we need them like in our world like uh, like they're the generation that's coming up that's gonna have to like (laughs) fix a lot of problems that are in our world right now and we need them to have hope and we need to encourage them and I 
you know, a lot of back to like the mental health, like the numbers are kind of staggering right now with how many teenagers, I mean, people in general, but specifically teens are suffering from mental health um, conditions. And those are only the, the diagnosed conditions, you know? And so I really wanted to write for this population specifically about this story because I wanted to give those teens hope. And are you hoping that in writing this as well, um, that the themes in your novel, such as friendship and support, that they'll resonate with teens? I mean, a lot has changed since the time any of us were teens, but in despite that, you know, the, the idea that you don't have to be isolated, right? Yeah, it's really interesting with social media now. It's completely a different world. Like my, I have a seven-year-old and he was like, well, mom, what were the cell phones like when you were little? And I was like, oh, we didn't, you know, like I didn't have an iPhone when I was little. And he's like, what? Like, you know, can't even like imagine. Like you're like ancient. So now it's so easy. And I do see this happening. And I know teachers see it too, where kids are just always on their phone. It's easy for them to be you know, well, I have lots of friends and I only text them, you know, like, like it's easy to live in this little social media bubble, but I think you miss a lot if you don't have that social interaction and you also miss connections with people that maybe like you just, you see someone or, or you, we all have these first impressions of people, right? We have like, oh, Sage, she's an athlete, so she must be this way. And Len, my character, she's an artist and she doesn't talk a lot, so she must be this way. And breaking down those stereotypes. And I think reaching out and getting to know people is those connections are really the best way that we can heal our world. I just think that we as a society are growing so disconnected and we're basically just arguing all the time and yelling at each other over on social media. And a lot of that results because that's the only way that we're connecting to people that are different from us, right? We're just like, we're segregating ourselves and and yelling at everyone. And we have to, in order to solve some of these huge problems, like we need to develop relationships in which we can speak civilly and um and work on solutions and i think at the end of the day that comes down to personal connections one other thing that i noticed in your novel too is not only personal connections between people but even when len is really struggling that connection to nature in those moments where she's really struggling she has these moments where you know nature can be triggering for her but it can also be something that makes her feel alive and more well than she's ever been so Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting how that connection to nature is really emphasized in your novel as well. Thank you. I'm glad that you liked that. My next book is actually going to, has a lot more environmental themes in it. Um, But that's, that is something that's important to me. And so I think it just comes out in my writing because, you know, we, we put so much of ourselves even unknowingly into our books, but I do think, and there's more and more information coming out all the time about how good it is to just be in nature, you know, like, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes if I am cooped up too much or if I'm on my phone too much or if I'm on social media, I almost feel physically sick. Like it just, it just like, it's just so much to process. Like there's just so much stuff and there's just something about being outside, like not having my shoes on, like touching the earth or like being in the garden going on a hike and just listening, like taking in the sounds, feeling actual air on my face, you know, having the sun beat down that just has, makes me feel better and makes me have a stillness. So I definitely put some of that in, in Len's character. And yeah, I definitely try to get my kids outside. I mean, I think they're happier when they're outside. We have like a little, little woods near our house and they just, I love when they're, you know, playing and making their fairy huts or whatever they do. They have all these adventures. Um, (laughs) So yeah, I hope, I guess if teens or if readers who maybe don't spend a lot of time in nature, maybe they'll read it and be like, oh, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll go on a hike and see if I can tap into this feeling. (laughs) I was saying to Jen earlier that it's, so just to put this in context for anyone listening, it is middle of March and everyone is very worried about the coronavirus. So reading oh a book gosh. where yeah. somebody is <laughs> very concerned about contagion, I imagine that right now in the world, a lot of people are very anxious and people who are maybe already anxious about this kind of thing are 
perhaps struggling. And I wondered, like, this is kind of a question for both of you, because I know both of you write about mental health a little bit. And what advice would you give to people that are maybe feeling a little bit overwhelmed by anxiety right now or at any time? I guess I I've thought about this a lot because I... <laughs> I was just talking to my husband yesterday. I was like, I'm just so glad I wasn't not in like crisis mode right now, you know, cause I don't know how I would have handled this, mm-hmm. this outbreak. But, um, I think just remembering that anxiety is a wave can be helpful that, you know, it will cycle through. And I think the biggest thing is disconnecting from social media. Honestly, there's so much fear and people get each other so ramped up. I think maybe just, Connecting with people that make you feel good and taking a break from the news and social media to the extent that you can. Definitely. I, I've seen some posts for OCD specific in concerns to the coronavirus. And I think there's a lot of great resources with the International OCD mm-hmm. Foundation. And basically it's it's advice that is very helpful for those with OCD, but just people in general, which is, yeah, you know, not to put your head in the sand, but limit your exposure to the news. You One trusty news source is probably enough. Mm-hmm. And if there are resources out there, I know a lot of professionals in the mental health industry right now are posting sort of tips for how you can sort of, you know, uh, for emo- uh, mental and emotional wellness. Because honestly, for me, what worries me, obviously, I'm worried about the physical impacts, uh, impact of, of it for a lot of people, namely, you know, the elderly. But mm-hmm. I also worry at large for a lot of people's emotional wellness right now. So, Oh, my gosh, for sure. And I mean, it's so bizarre for me. I mean, I had to do so much cognitive behavioral therapy to stop, to limit how much I wash my hands, you know? So it is bizarre to have all of these like authority figures being like you need to wash your hands you need to wash your hands you need to wash your hands you know it's like like, (laughs) so hearing that all the time and everyone's like wash your hands wash your hands and when you've worked so hard to be like I don't need to wash my hands right now (laughs) like you know finding that balance of when is what's a reasonable amount to wash your hands when is it appropriate you know like yes yeah, certainly after you come home from doing things but like if you've been in your house do you need to wash your hands you know every 5 minutes no like and that i really feel for anxiety sufferers and particularly ocd sufferers because that's what yeah that and i think that's great advice limiting <laughs> You know, you, you do want to know what's going on, but I mean, we live in the 24-hour news cycle and that has major problems, you know, with uh, anxiety. So trying to distance yourself from that, I think is great advice. I liked that one of your characters, like a big concern for her is the financial impact of knowing that you need to go and get a diagnosis and talk to a doctor yeah. and in certain countries, that's not always the easiest thing. So um, I love that she was able to find a resource in the book. And it kind of highlights that maybe younger people are worried about that as well as everything else. So I like, I know you included a list in your books and we'll definitely share that when we post this. Any like shout outs from either of you about really good resources that are available to everyone? Well, Jen mentioned the um, International OCD Foundation. I think that's a great resource. There are a number, I know young people love podcasts, (laughs) and there are a number of mental health podcasts, OCD-specific podcasts, which I think can be really helpful because I know when I was really in the throes of severe OCD, I wanted stories that were people like me, that were people like, you know, I wanted to hear like, quote unquote, normal people that were just going through this experience because that's what people suffering mental health are. They're not like these weird alien people. They're just normal people, you know, that are going through these experiences and hearing how they got through them, hearing success stories. And I find that I still like listening to them. I still like hearing how people have challenges in their life, but that doesn't define them. It's not who they are, you know, and how they live their life anyway. So I think finding those kinds of resources, and they're pretty easy to find, you know, just Googling. I would definitely recommend checking those out, Jen. Definitely. And some other great authors that you're, you know, in the canon of uh, (laughs) who've written about OCD, especially for teens, Lily Bailey is -hmm. one of them, Alison Dotson, Fletcher Wortman. So there are specific 
books that, I mean, adults will get just as much out of them too, but right. uh, that have teens in mind. So I find those narratives are so helpful because it really, as much as you can put statistics up, it is it really is those personal stories of overcoming. And even if overcoming means that, like you were mentioning, you know, your symptoms are now sort of in check, right? So mm-hmm. it's a realistic overcoming uh, of everything, but there's there's so much good content out there that it's, uh, you know, as much as there's never really a great time to have OCD, it's a pretty good time uh, to be able to for to sure, yeah, it, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely better than like 30 years ago or 50 or 100 definitely. years ago. I mean, gosh. Oh, and there's another um, great resource too, um, Teen Librarian Toolbox that lives on um, School Library Journal's homepage. They have mm-hmm. awesome resources on there, and I'm actually um, writing something for them as well about my own experience in my book, but. Yeah, there's posts from authors, there's stats and statistics and bibliotherapy, basically. So there's all all kinds of great resources right now. Yeah, I feel like everything you guys are saying is exactly why I like working with books, because I think that storytelling is what changes the world. And yeah. like what I was sounding too trite, but it's true. Like, I feel like that breeds empathy and reading a story is so different. Like you said earlier, like self-help books are not necessarily what everyone wants, but mm-hmm. reading about someone else or knowing that you're not the only one in the world is mm-hmm. really, really important. So, Well, and there's that idea too of, of like, you can't change someone's mind by reaching out to their intellect, right? Like we can post stats all day. And if someone believes a certain thing, it's really difficult to change their mind. But if you can reach out to someone's heart, that's the way that you change mind. That's the way that you develop empathy. That's the way that you maybe convince someone to get help. I mean, I, for a long time, when I was first, before I was diagnosed, I was like, you know, I was raised in a culture that was very much, you don't show mental weakness, you know? And so I I really was like, no, like I, I, I'm super strong. I will get through this. Like I can handle whatever's happening to me. And I think stories are a really great way to get to people's hearts. Agreed. Agreed, yeah. <laughs> what can readers expect from you next? What are you working on? Well, I have a very exciting project that's coming out in October with Candlewick, and it's called Ooh. Rural Voices. It's an anthology, and it, it, there's 15 authors, and it's called, well, it's Rural Voices, 15 Authors Challenge Stereotypes of Small Town America. And I'm super excited about that because especially since the 2016 election in um, the United States, there have, there's been this idea that rural people in America are all the same and we all think a certain way and we all have the same politics and beliefs and ideas. And um, that has been really harmful for um, a lot of people. So that book um, is going to crack that myth wide open, and I'm super excited about that. And my next project that I'm working on right now, I can't tell you too much about, but it is another um, YA contemporary, and it's set in rural West Virginia, and it has some environmental themes. That's pretty much all I can say. It's also a dual narrative, and it's it's going to be, there's going to be a romance element in it. There's, mm-hmm. um, so it's a little bit different. <laughs> awesome. That sounds great. And we always like to finish by asking, what have you been loving lately? It can be a book or television or anything at all. Yeah. So I'm currently reading The Starless Sea. And I'm really, I'm listening to it. I need to clarify. I do most of my reading. You love audio? Yes. Love it. It's books like that. You can kind of see like masterful storytelling really gives me something to aspire to, you know. So I've really been loving that. Um, Let me see. I just finished... The Scythe trilogy. I forget the Ark of the Scythe, I think is what the, the trilogy is called. I really enjoyed that as well. And yeah, just some of my fellow debut mate stuff. There's a lot of great books coming out. So I don't get to watch a lot of TV. I don't really have any TV recommendations. Sorry. Fair enough. <laughs> Are you going to have an audio version of The Edge of Anything? Yes, there will be an audio version. Um, for some reason, it's not coming out until, like, my, it's weird. It's like the contract is like it's going to come out nine months after the book, which is okay. bizarre. But it, yes, it will. I'm so excited that there will be an audio book version. That's really cool. Are you going to have any part in that picking narrators or anything or is that really your publisher 
I have no idea since this is my first one. I don't know. I know some authors get to listen to the people trying out for the part, you know, and I hope that I would get a little bit of impact or in a little bit of say in that, but I honestly just don't have any idea. New adventures. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. This was really great. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on and for, you know, talking about mental health and lifting that up. I appreciate that too. Oh, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. We appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you're looking for Nora's book, we'll have a link to it on our blog post. Or if you're interested in reading Jen's articles about OCD, we'll have links to those as well. If you're interested in learning how to grow yourselves, visit KoboWritingLife.com. This episode was produced by Joni DiPlacido and Jennifer Shenuda. Music was provided by Tearjerker. Editing was by Kelly Robotham. And big thank you to Nora Shalloway Carpenter for being a guest in our podcast. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at Kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.